Good morning, everyone. Thanks for getting up early to come and uh, see me talk today. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about how we can get compilers for free. Um, as Ruby programmers, we've already got an intuitive understanding of the power of metaprogramming, right? Programs that write programs, because Ruby's got all of these features in it, like instance eval and define method and method missing, that let us kind of make programs that grow new functionality at runtime, that dynamically define new classes, or that dynamically define new methods and, and things like that. But there's another thing that is also part of metaprogram that, that I find even more interesting, and that's programs that manipulate representations of other programs. So those are programs that operate on data which itself represents a program and then does something with that representation, like it analyzes it or evaluates it or translates it or, or transforms it. Um, and that's the world of compilers and interpreters and static analyzers. And I think that those things are really fascinating. Like In a way, they're the, the purest or the most kind of self-referential software that you can write. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. And my goal here is to try and make you look at programs differently. I don't have a, like a complicated technical point that I want to make to you. I just want to kind of, at the end, I'm going to tell you a cool story. And in between, I want to try and convince you that programs that manipulate other programs are interesting and hopefully inspire you to learn a bit more about them. So first, let's have a look at what it means to execute a program before anything else. What we normally do, how we normally think of executing programs, is that we've got a program, and then we put that program inside a machine. And when that program is inside a machine, we can then run it by providing inputs to it. And those inputs might be command line arguments or configuration files or standard input or whatever. And once we feed the input into the program, that program runs and produces some output. Now, that kind of simple idea of what it means to run a program only makes sense if the program is already written in a language that the underlying machine understands. So that you know, typically would be machine code if you're going to be running it on a physical machine. Or if you've got a virtual machine like the JVM, your program might be written in a slightly higher level language like Java bytecode. But if your program's written in a language that is unfamiliar to the physical or virtual machine, then you need something else. You need an interpreter or a compiler to be able to run that program for you. So I'm going to show you a little bit about interpreters and just have a look at how do interpreters work. They're pretty simple, really. Um, first, an interpreter reads in some source code, so your program that you want to run. And then it builds an abstract syntax tree by parsing that source code into this sort of uh, structured representation of the program. And then it evaluates that program by sort of recursively walking over the abstract syntax tree and performing the instructions that it finds. And this is really how you know, all simple interpreters work, like pre-Ruby 1.9. This is how MRI worked as well. So I don't have very much time to actually go through and implement uh, an interpreter for you, but I'll just very quickly show you. Here, here's an example programming language that's got statements like assignment and has got expressions like addition. So I can say, add two numbers together and assign them to a variable. Or I can put a semicolon between two statements and do one after the other. Or I can do things like have a conditional with an else clause. Or I can do something like have a while loop. So this is a really simple imperative language. It looks a little bit like Ruby, but it's, it's not Ruby. I've just got some sort of very simple bits of syntax there. Now, if you've got a programming language like that, you can write a parser for it that's going to create these abstract syntax trees out of it. And if you were going to do this in Ruby, you would want to have some classes that represent all of the different kinds of nodes in an abstract syntax tree. So let's say that I've got classes called number and boolean and variable and all of the rest of the pieces of syntax I expect to see in a program. Now, I don't have time to go through and show you how to write a parser for this language, but let's just say that we have a parser for it. And we can say something like, you know, parser.parse some string of source code. And the parser is going to return an abstract syntax tree. So it's going to give you something a bit like this. So this is a, a, a struct made out of, I mean, that sequence class is a class that we defined, and we've defined all of the other classes inside there. And the shape of that struct represents the shape of the original program. So sort of looking at it diagrammatically, this is that abstract syntax tree tells us that what we have is a sequence of two statements. And the first statement is an assignment of the number 2 to the variable x. And the second statement is the assignment of the result of multiplying the variable x by 3 to the variable y. And once we've got an abstract syntax tree like that, then we can evaluate it by recursively walking over it. 
And we can do that in Ruby by just having definitions of an evaluate method on each of those classes of the abstract syntax tree. So all of the classes that represent leaves of the tree are just going to do something very simple. So when we try to evaluate a number or try to evaluate a Boolean, we're just going to return the value that's stored inside that number or Boolean. If you evaluate a variable, um, this evaluate method is going to take an environment that's a hash that maps variable names onto their values. And when you evaluate a variable, it's just going to look up the name of that variable in the hash. So that lets us do simple things like if you evaluate the number three, you get three. If you evaluate the Boolean false, you get false. And if you evaluate the variable y, then you get whatever its value is in the environment that you pass in, right? And then we can go through and implement that evaluate for um, larger, you know, more structured uh, abstract syntax tree nodes. So for these binary expressions, like uh, adding or multiplying or comparing two numbers, in each case, we just evaluate the left and the right kind of uh, branches of the abstract syntax tree, and then we just you know, add them or multiply them or, or compare them or whatever. So we can say multiply x and y where x is 2 and y is 3, and we get 6. So we can say is x less than y when x is 2 and y is 3, and the answer is yes. And then, you know, I'm not going to go through how this works, but you can do the same for statements. The difference with statements is that they affect the values of variables. So whereas when you evaluate expressions, you just get a new value back, with statements, you return a new environment. So if you've got an assignment, you just return a new, in a new environment that's got a new mapping in it that maps the name of the variable in the assignment to the result of evaluating the expression and, and so on for the other things. So that allows us to do things like, say, what happens when I assign x to 1 in an empty environment? The answer is you get an environment where x has the value 1. What happens if I do a sequence of two assignments where x is 1 and y is 2? In an empty environment, you get an environment where x is 1 and y is 2. And the point of doing all this is so that we can plug it into the parser and say, well, here's a program. I want to parse it and then evaluate it, and then you get the answer out at the end. So you can see I can evaluate a sequence of statements. I can evaluate a sequence of statements where one of them is a while loop. This, is just a while. this whole program is something that initializes x to 1, and then it sits in a loop multiplying x by 3 while x is less than 5. And it comes out and says, well, I've, I've found 9 is a power of 3, but that's greater than 5, so I've stopped. So that's like a, a really quick whirlwind tour of what an interpreter does and how it does it. But the point of an interpreter is to provide what I'm calling here single stage execution. And what I mean by that is you've got your interpreter and you feed into it your source program. And also, in general, I, I didn't show it in that slide, but in general, you might have some other input that is available to the program that you're interpreting. And then the interpreter is going to you know, run that source code. It's going to evaluate it and produce some output. And this is assuming, of course, that the interpreter itself is written in a language that the underlying machine knows how to execute. And this kind of process where you put the source code and the input in and the interpreter runs and you get some output, that all happens at the same time that we usually call runtime. But that's different to how a compiler works. Let's have a quick look at that. How does a compiler work? Well, it starts out the same way. First, it reads some source code. And then it builds an abstract syntax tree by parsing the source code. But then it does something else. It, rather than evaluating the code, it generates some more code by walking over the abstract syntax tree and emitting some instructions. And this is, although this is a simplified view, this is pretty much how a lot of, um, a lot of compilers work. This is how the sort of Java C, Java compiler works. This is how the sort of front ends of Yav and Rubinius work, just this sort of simple process of walking over a tree and emitting some code in a different language. So just very briefly, this is the kind of thing we could do with those abstract syntax tree classes. Instead of having an evaluate method on them, I could have like a to.js method that generates strings of JavaScript. So if you've got a number, it generates some JavaScript that's a function that takes an environment and just returns the number. This a, a Boolean is just a function that returns the Boolean. And a variable is a function that looks up the variable in the environment. So instead of doing those things, we're just emitting JavaScript that does those things. And similarly, we can do the same thing for you know, adding things together. We say, well, we wanna, first we want to convert the left and the right sub-expressions to JavaScript, and then we're going to evaluate them and add the results together you know, in the resulting JavaScript. And you know, don't try and read all this, but this is the translation to JavaScript of all of the statements as well. And the point of doing that is so that we can take something like this program before that, that, finds, you know, that calculates x to be 9, and we can say, turn that into JavaScript for me, and you get this giant JavaScript program out. And then once you've got that giant JavaScript program, later on, you can take that program, and I've reformatted it slightly. You can paste this reformatted program into like the Node.js console or whatever. And then you can run it and say, well, what happens when I run this program with an empty environment? You probably can't see that. It says x is 9. 
So I haven't run that program inside the interpreter. I've generated that program with the interpreter, and then I've run it somewhere else inside Node. This compiler is really stupid, obviously. You can see that it's created this gigantic program to do something very simple. But it does illustrate the fact that we, it, it lets us execute that program in the original language on a machine that understands a different language, in this case, on a machine that only understands JavaScript. So the idea of a compiler is it provides this two-stage execution. You have your compiler, and you put your source program into it, and then you execute your compiler, and that produces what we usually call the target program, the compiled version of your source. And then at a later time, you can take that target program and run it you know, when you want to run it. And at the time when you run it, you provide the input to that program, and it runs and it produces the output. So instead of doing it all at once, you've separated the job of executing the program into two separate stages. The first stage we'd usually call compile time, and the second stage is what we'd call runtime. Now, the reason we do this in the first place is that these compiled programs are usually faster. Having a compiled program removes the what I've called the interpretive overhead. So at the time when you actually run the program, you will already have done the work of parsing the source code and walking over the abstract syntax tree and, and like looking at all of the instructions in it. So it definitely gets some of the work done sooner so that when it comes time to run the program, you don't have to do that work again. And there are other performance benefits of compilers as well that I'm not going to talk about. But obviously, compilers have got sophisticated optimizations and clever ways of representing data, especially based on knowledge of the underlying architecture, that allows the programs to run faster than they would have done interpreted, even without the overhead of parsing and walking the syntax tree and stuff. But there's bad news as well. Like Compiling programs is just more difficult than interpreting them. Um, when you write a compiler, you have to think about these two execution times instead of one. You don't just have runtime, you have compile time and runtime. And when you're writing your compiler, you have to have both of those times in your head and think about whether the code that you're writing is code that's going to run at compilation time or code that's going to run as part of the runtime. Um, and because of that, you also have to sort of implement in two languages instead of one. You know, that compiler that I wrote there in Ruby, it was also, it had JavaScript in it as well. So I had to think about both the implementation language of the compiler and the target language of the compiler, which in general are going to be different programming languages. And also, very vaguely, compiling dynamic languages is difficult. And there was some, you know, some talks yesterday about why it's difficult to compile dynamic languages. But generally, it's just because your program might change at runtime. You might want your program to change at runtime. In an interpreter, that's no problem. If your abstract syntax tree changes while the program is executing, then that's fine. The interpreter will just, when it's like repeatedly walking over the abstract syntax tree, if that tree changes, then the behavior of the interpreter changes. But in a compiler, you've thrown the abstract syntax tree away by the time you come to run your program. And so it's much harder to support the kind of dynamic features that we want to have in a language like Ruby, for example. So in summary, writing an interpreter is easier to do, but interpreters are slower than compilers. You know, writing an interpreter, you only have to think about one time, runtime. You only have to think about one language, which is the language you're implementing your interpreter in. And you can be as dynamic as you like. And there's no, there's no um, complexity cost there. There may be a time cost, but it's not more difficult to do. So in an ideal world, we would all just write interpreters. But of course, we want compilers um, because they make our programs go faster. So I've, I've mentioned interpreters and compilers. There's a third kind of thing called a partial evaluator that I, is really why I'm here talking to you today. Um, and a partial evaluator is like an interpreter or a compiler. And in fact, it's sort of a cross between the two of them. So I've said that interpreters can execute a program right now. And compilers can generate code right now to be executed later. And partial evaluators kind of live somewhere in the middle. They evaluate some of the code now and leave the rest of it for execution later. So the way that works is you, a partial evaluator is something that you put a program into. It's called the subject program. And you provide some of the inputs to that program, but not all of its inputs. And the partial evaluator evaluates only the bits of the program that depend on the inputs that you've provided. And it leaves behind a program called the residual program. So it's like when you boil water and you get a residue left over. This partial evaluator kind of <laughs> heats up your program, and then there's a residue left, which is the, the residual program. So this is what that looks like. You, if you've got your normal subject program, then your, the way you think about evaluating a program is that you have your inputs to that program, and you would run it, and it would pr produce the output. That's the kind of runtime way of thinking about your program. 
But what a partial evaluator allows you to do is to take some of that process and kind of time shift it earlier, time shift it into the past and do that work first so that the rest of the work can be done later. So let's see how that works. You take your subject program and some of its input, and instead of treating the subject program as something you're going to execute, you're treating it as data that you're going to provide as input to a partial evaluator. So you feed your subject program and some of its input into a partial evaluator, and then when you run that, you get the residual program. And then later on, you can take that residual program and provide the rest of the input to it and run the residual program, and you get the final output. So instead of doing it all at once, you've kind of pulled it apart into two different execution stages. This is called partially evaluating the subject program with respect to you know, input number one. So as I said, the point of this is to sort of split the single stage execution into two stages by doing that kind of time shifting of processing some of the input from when you're going to run the program in the future to right now, you know, ahead of time. So how does that, how's that done? How does a partial evaluator do that? And very briefly, it starts out like a compiler or an interpreter. It reads some source code, and it builds an abstract syntax tree by parsing that source code. But then instead of evaluating it or compiling it, it reads some of the program's input. So there'll be some mechanism for you to say, well, I've got, you know, I've got your command line arguments, but not your standard input, say. And then it will analyze the program doing what's called a binding time analysis. It will walk over the whole abstract syntax tree to find all of the places where, to find all of the bits of the program that only depend on the inputs that are already available. And then when it's found those places, it will evaluate those bits of the program and replace those fragments of the program with the result of having evaluated them. And then when it's finished doing that, it emits the the program with all of those bits replaced, and you get your residual program out. So I don't have enough time to show you this on like a whole Ruby program, but I can show it to you on the level of a single method. So just for demonstration purposes, <coughs> imagine that we've got a, a method called power. So this method raises x to the power of n, and it just does it by recursively calling itself. If you're raising a number to the power of 0, it will just return 1. Otherwise, it will multiply that number by the result of raising it to the power of n minus 1. So this will call itself several times and then eventually return the right answer. But let's imagine that somehow we know <coughs> that we're going to be calling this method with the first argument 5. So what a partial evaluator would be able to do is have a look at this method and say, OK, well, if we know that n is going to have the value 5, then we can do some of this work sooner. Firstly, we can find all of the places where n is used, and we can look at all of these computations that involve the value of n, and we can do them now instead of later on when the program runs, when we know what the value of x is going to be. So what that means is that we're going to create a specialized version of this power function. Rather than having a, a function of two arguments called power, we're going to have a function of one argument and call it power 5. It doesn't take n anymore. It just takes x. And the way that the analysis works is that we just say, well, let's find all of the places where n was mentioned and replace them with the number 5. And then once we've done that, we can evaluate, oh, is 5 0? No, it's not. So that's going to be false. And then we can evaluate this whole conditional and say, well, if false, it's just going to be the, the else clause there. So we've already done some of the work of the program. And then we keep going and say, oh, look, we can see that we've got 5 minus 1 there. We can just replace that with 4. And at that point, we can say, well, now we're calling power with a known argument again. So we can repeat the whole process. We can say, well, we know what the definition of power is. So we can just inline the definition of power there with 4 in place of the argument n. And we can do the whole process again. Is 4 0? No, it isn't. If false, well, we're going to go to the else clause then. And then we're calling power with 4 minus 1, which we know is 3. And we can repeat that process a few times. We can, you know, we end up generating more multiplications. So x times x times x times x times x until we get to x times power 0x. And when we inline the definition of power there, we get to a situation where this 0.0, .0 evaluates to true, and we end up just returning the, you know, the main clause of the conditional there. So just to tidy that up a bit, after the partial evaluators had its way with that method, we end up with a method that just multiplies x by itself five times and then multiplies it by one. And actually, any um, partial evaluator worth its salt would understand that multiplying something by one doesn't do anything, so it might just be able to remove that. So this is our residual program. Um, you can see that this, is, this does the same job as calling power with five as its first argument, but it does it 
faster, it does it more efficiently. Whereas before we were having to recursively call the same function and we were having to allocate stack frames and do lots of comparisons and predicates and stuff, now we're just doing the job that would have happened when you called that method with five as the first argument, which is multiply x by itself five times. And so sort of crucially, the partial evaluator hasn't invented any new code here, but what it has done is stuck together bits of the original program to, you know, to do the job that you wanted it to do. So I said there was going to be a cool story. Um, here's the cool story. Um, in 1971, this guy, Yoshihiko Futamura, who was working at uh, Hitachi Central Research Laboratory, realized something quite cool. He was thinking about partial evaluators and thinking about how when you do partial evaluation, you have inputs to your subject program, and you run it and you get your output, but you take some of that and do it sooner to separate the evaluation of the subject program into two separate stages, like I just showed you. And he was thinking about this in the context of interpreters and thinking, well, an interpreter is really just a program. When I have an interpreter, I have some inputs to it. One of those inputs I'm calling the source program, but really an interpreter is just a program that you run. You provide data to it, and it gives you some output. So what would happen if I used partial evaluation to kind of time shift part of this process earlier so that the rest of the work of processing the input could be done later on? So this is what happens if you do that. You treat your interpreter as data, so the source code of your interpreter, and you feed the interpreter and the source program into a partial evaluator, and you get a residual program out. So the partial evaluator does the work of executing as much of the interpreter as possible based on the source program that's going to be fed to the interpreter and produces this residual program. And then later on, you can take your residual program, feed your runtime input into it, and get some output. But when he thought about this, he thought, well, this thing down here that takes the input, and when we run it, we get the output. Normally, we call that the target program. That's a version of the original program that runs on the underlying machine. That's what the target program is. So that means that what I got out of the partial evaluator here was a target program. So there's something going on here. Whatever's inside this green box is something that can take the source program and emit a target program that we can run later. Um, so what do we have inside that green box? Does anyone know? Right, that's a compiler. So there's your compiler for free, right? Now, that seems a bit too good to be true. How does that even work? Let's go through a really quick example. So let's say that uh, toy interpreter I showed you before, um, I filled it out a little bit more. We don't have the parser here, and we don't have all of the evaluate methods. But at the top level, you could imagine this is what your kind of main.rb would be. You would say, I want to read in the source code that I'm going to interpret somehow. And then I want to read in the environment somehow, so the values, of the initial values of all the variables. Maybe you're going to get those from different files or something. And then I'm going to build an abstract syntax tree by parsing the source. And then I'm going to evaluate the abstract syntax tree in the context of the environment that's been provided. Now, if we use a partial evaluator and we have the source code available at the time we're doing the partial evaluation, that means the partial evaluator can go in and say, oh, I know what read source is going to be. It's going to be this string. And if we know that the source is going to be this string, well, the only place where source is used is here. So we can get rid of the source variable altogether and just say, well, we want the AST to be the result of parsing that string. But the parser would also be, av be available at partial evaluation time, because that's just part of the interpreter. So we'd be able to do that speculatively and actually come up with the abstract syntax tree of the program you know, during partial evaluation. And then all of the, you know, what we end up doing is calling evaluate on the root node of that abstract syntax tree. But when you look at that abstract syntax tree, we've got definitions of evaluate for all of these classes. We know what evaluate looks like for sequences and for these assignments and for multiplication and for numbers and variables. And now we've got all of the information we need to partially evaluate all of this code. We can go through and say, OK, well, we know that the, the result of value here is going to be 2, and we know that the result of value here is going to be 3, and we know the result of this is going to be looking up x in the environment, so we can inline that code. And then all of these places where we're recursively evaluating the sub-expressions, we can just inline their values in there. And then all these places where we're merging values into the environment, we know the, the name there is going to be x, and we know the name there is going to be y. And here, where we're doing one thing and then another thing, well, we've already got all of the code that we're going to use there, so I can just inline all of that code in. So I did that very quickly, but what you end up with there is some code that 
does whatever calling evaluate on the abstract syntax tree would do. And the partial evaluator can figure all that out ahead of time. So once we know what calling evaluate is going to do, we can go back to this like main.rb and just say, well, ast.evaluate of the environment on that particular abstract syntax tree is just going to be that code that we generated. And if you compare this thing here to our original you know, made up program in a made up programming language, this is kind of, in a way, a, a, a Ruby version of that program. It says read in some environment and then set x to 2 in that environment and then print out the result of setting y to whatever the value of x is times 3. That's sort of what this program says. So although we haven't made up any new Ruby code, we have stuck together bits of the interpreter to make a Ruby version of our program. And that's really how it's been compiled to Ruby. This is called the first Futamora projection, that if you, take, if you partially evaluate an interpreter with respect to a source program, you get a target program. So Futamura was pretty pleased when he worked this out. But then he thought about it a bit more. And he thought, well, um, this thing that I'm doing here, where I'm feeding an interpreter and a source program into a partial evaluator, what would happen if I did some of that earlier using partial evaluation? This is just feeding some data into a program. The program happens to be a partial evaluator. So here's what happens if you do that. You treat the partial evaluator as data, and you feed that into the partial evaluator and specialize it with respect to the interpreter, you get a residual program out. And then later on, you can run that residual program with the source program as input and get the target program. And then later on, you can run that target program with input as input and get the output. Now, the, th the residual program here is a compiler that we saw before. So what you've got out of the partial evaluator is a compiler. So this whole thing here is a compiler generator. And that's the second Futamura projection, that if you partially evaluate a partial evaluator with respect to an interpreter, you get a compiler. So Futamura was pretty pleased when he worked that out. Um, but he thought about it a bit more. Specifically, he thought about what's going on at the top here. He thought, well, all we're doing is feeding a partial evaluator into, you know, all we're doing is running a program with some input here. What would happen if we did some of that work earlier? So here's what happens. If you treat the partial evaluator as data, and you feed the partial evaluator and the partial evaluator into the partial evaluator, you get a residual program out. And then later on, you can run the residual program with an interpreter as input, and you get a compiler out. And then later on, you can run the compiler with a source program as input, and you get a target program out. And then later on, you can run the target program with your input, and you get your output. So the residual program that's been produced here is a compiler generator. So that means we got a compiler generator out of the partial evaluator. So that means that this whole thing up here is a compiler generator generator. And that's the third Futamura projection, that if you partially evaluate a partial evaluator with respect to a partial evaluator, you get a compiler generator. And luckily, that's as far as we can go. Because if you kept doing that, you're just doing this thing again. You're just generating more compiler generators. Now, that's just, I would just like to say, that's a fully general technique for generating compilers. It only removes that interpretive overhead I talked about. It doesn't invent new data structures or, or, or optimizations or exploit anything about the underlying platform. So we still need smart people to write compilers. So I'm out of time now. I've got a longer write-up of this on the web. So if you want to see that with more code and a more cogent explanation than I've given you now, you can read that online. Uh, but otherwise, if you have any questions, you can ask me afterwards. Thanks very much. Thank <laughs> you.